While the flood of 1965 brought many changes to the Mankato community, one of those community staples never returned. KEYC News 12's Ashley Hanley brings us the story of the Sibley Park Zoo. There were lions, tigers, and bears. No oh my. Mankato native and retired KEYC anchor Kurt Crandall vividly remembers the exotic animals that grazed the Sibley Park Zoo. There was a bird there that would always say, Hi, Bob. And I remember we had a friend whose name was Bob, and we took him, Oh, we're going to take you to the zoo. He got there, and right away when he got out of the car, that bird said, Hi, Bob, and he was impressed. And while Bob was able to fly away to safety, many other creatures were grounded. They talked about moving some animals out. They were going to build some higher boxes, but apparently none of that got done. And uh, they said they, they opened cages for animals and birds that, that were non-dangerous, but mainly they didn't leave. They were too used to their cages. Around 25 animals died in the flood, including the lions. The diving club from Mankato State went in and into the, the building and discovered what was there and it was nothing alive, or very few alive. There are a few uh, creatures that, that did live. After the flood, city officials say they outlined 19 projects to be completed and all but the zoo was eventually done. Although there is a petting zoo here today. You had just mentioned that there were sandbagging efforts uh, around um, Sibley Park, and one of the stories uh, that we're airing in this is uh, about the zoo that had been at Sibley Park, that many of the animals died in the flood because the water just came in so quickly. It did. So they had, they, this zoo was a premier zoo at the time. It, 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 quite different than this, the petting zoo, um, the farm zoo that we have today. It was a zoo with lions and monkeys and all kinds of animals that you just can't believe were a part <laughs> of a zoo in Mankato. Um, but because they had, they, well, what do you do with a bunch of right. zoo animals? Well, you keep them in their cages, you keep them safe, and you build flood walls or you build up sandbags. And they did, and they watched that those sandbags, and then all of a sudden they, there were holes, and the holes got bigger and bigger and bigger. So they had to quickly um, try to save the animals. So many of the large animals, they knocked down fences and just said, you know, go, just get to high ground, and some of them did. So I think at one point they found a buffalo, um, because there was a buffalo in the zoo. They found a buffalo, you know, up on, on a hill, high and dry. Um, but they're the small caged animals that you really can't just say, okay, Hey, snakes slither away you know obviously some of those small animals were trapped in their cages and they ended up dying um, and there we had some lions um, and the lions actually ended up dying even though there wasn't a lot of water in their cage it was the exposure of the cold weather because it was a really cold rainy damp week so it was the exposure of being in just a little bit of water and being in that cold environment and unfortunately due to exposure the lions were killed as well. Um, any of the animals that survived were transported to different zoos like Como Zoo um, and really the, that was kind of the end of the remarkable um, Sibley Park Zoo because after that to be able to rebuild it was just too difficult. Despite the efforts by many in the community to keep the area dry, devastation came when one of the temporary dikes broke, flooding a portion of the city, including a well-known Mankato grocery store. KEYC News 12's Ashley Hanley has that story. It's hard for many of us to imagine now, but in 1965, this entire area, what is now Riverfront Drive by Cub Foods, was completely underwater. And then there was a different grocery store in the Cub parking lot called Madsen's, where the workers worked tirelessly to salvage what they could. I remember going to work that day, a uh, normal day, a day as usual. I being the produce manager. But for Armin Schul, the day became anything but normal. And in the store, there was still, uh, there was shopping carts half full. People were shopping. And all of a sudden, the water came in the store, the lights went out, and everybody had to leave the carts sitting right there. And even in the restaurant, the ca uh, there was a, um, somebody had ordered a hamburger and french fries. And the plate of hamburger and french fries sat there for several days before it finally got cleaned up. Armin and the rest of the workers waded through the waters that had flooded their store. What's amazing is that within 13 days from the water, when the water came in, the building was back open. Showing the resiliency of those fighting back the rushing water. Hope nobody had to go through that again. Kind of like a nightmare <laughs> that you don't necessarily wake up from right away. Mary Miller remembers being a young mother during the time. They closed both the laundromats and the um, car washes because of the problem with possible contamination of the water supply. So 
needless to say, it was a time before Pampers and Huggies, so I had all these very disturbing <laughs> smelling diapers. But she, like the grocery store workers, remembers the good as strangers became friends. I think the sense of community, everybody worked together. They patrolled the dike 24 seven, and it, there wasn't, you know, should we do this, shouldn't we do that? It was a matter of everybody, whatever they saw that could be done, they did it. Pulling together to rise above the waters. And we'd also talked about um, Matson's Grocery Store, which many people are certainly familiar. That's that's kind of in the uh, where Cub Foods West is at Riverfront Drive and Stoltzman Road. Um, and that area was also kind of on an old, you know, had been built up, sure, but it was also really as an old creek bed. And uh, you had also said that a lot of that uh, flooding in that area was because of some of the sandbagging that had been done that actually failed. Right. So they had done sandbagging, especially in, around Sibley Park. Um, so there was sandbagging around Sibley Park and around that West Mankato and um, that, that area by Matson's or Cub West. And so all of that area had been sandbagged because it was a little bit of a lower elevation. And they were doing fine. And then it was later in that week when the floodwaters were creeping up higher and higher where flood or those dikes, those earthen dikes, sandbagged dikes, started failing. And that just, that's why um, West Mankato was evacuated. Um, they had the entire basement of Matson's was flooded. They, I think they had three feet of water in the aisles at Matson's grocery store. So that whole area was completely underwater. And of course, that's where Indian Creek is um, feeding in, the Blue Earth River is feeding in, the Minnesota River. So it was just an area where there was just too much water and there was nowhere for it to go. The flood of 1965 forever changed the landscape of Mankato. After the flood, that's when the community came together to make sure a flood of that magnitude never happened again. KEYC News 12's Ashley Hanley brings us that story. A drive along the Minnesota River shows a sure sign of the mighty power of the waters. They might be kind of an eyesore, but they sure have saved a lot here in the city of Mankato. But these bland cement walls weren't there in 1965. Sometimes we complain about it, but other times we rejoice about it. It was the flood wall project. Um, that was a flood mitigation project that happened, basically they started it 10 years after the um, 65 flood. For, so from 1975 to about 1988, um, they worked on building that flood wall, that flood mitigation system to prevent anything like this happening again. And as devastating as the 1965 flood was, it wasn't the highest the water levels of the Minnesota River ever were. That record belongs to 1993, when the water levels reached more than 30 feet. But thanks to city officials and the Army Corps of Engineers, they erected these flood walls to ensure that the damage from 1993 wasn't as severe. would like to say no, that'll never happen again, but uh, you don't know. I mean, that this the flood walls that we have and the stuff we have here in Mankato is designed excellently. Um, but you never know when something could happen. But what also happened was another tradition to celebrate all the good in the community, North Mankato Fun Days. It was really meant as a way to thank all of the people that had worked on the flood um, during building the dikes, serving food, serving sandwiches, providing shelter for people who were displaced. And it was a way to bring them all together and just celebrate that they made it through the flood and to thank them for all their hard work. Making it through the worst by bringing out their best. So obviously nowadays when we talk about spring flooding, whether it's from uh, heavy snow and a melt or uh, summer flooding like we had in June of 2014, we must take flood preparations for granted, you know, here in the greater Mankato area because we have the flood walls, but that wasn't always the case. And in fact, some people think that some of that flood protection came out of the 1965 flood, but it was actually in the planning stages well before that, and it was a very long process. It was. Um, so Mankato, North Mankato, really started doing some preparations after the 1951 flood because they saw the impact there and they knew something had to be done. But it was actually an act of Congress mm -hmm. in 1958 that allowed for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to do a flood, it was a flood control bill. 
that was enacted by Congress that allowed the, the, um, the Army Corps of Engineers to go out across the nation and deal with some flood control mitigation and projects and things like that. So because of that legislation, they were able to um, allocate funds to the state of Minnesota, and in our case, to our region right here. Sure, and it's a lot of things that you might not necessarily think of uh, when it comes that we can see. We, we, you know, we see the flood walls, we see the cement walls, mm -hmm. but there's things that we don't necessarily see, and a lot of it took several years. As you said, you know, the Act of Congress happened in the 1950s. Complete ending of that project. Some of it didn't come here until the 90s. Yeah. So. Um, there, there's so much to this, and I think that's we, depending on what time period you've lived in Mankato, you maybe don't realize um, how long and how large of a project this was. But after the 65 flood, it was imperative that there was some kind of flood control mitigation sure. that was happening in this region. Uh, the flooding was just was just too much. And even with that said, the um, the top. 10 worst floods that we've had on along the Minnesota and Blue Earth Rivers has happened after 65 which is kind of hard to believe right. but it's because of these this flood control projects that have allowed us to not really feel that impact so one of the other things that came out of all of these projects one of the very last project to happen was dealing with three bridges along the Minnesota and Blue Earth Rivers um, the North Star Bridge and the, which is 169, the Main Street Bridge was taken out and Veterans Memorial Bridge right. was put in, which crosses the Minnesota River, and then the Blue Earth River down by CHS in the Hillier South Bend area, all of those bridges were replaced. And the reason they were replaced is because they were raised 15 to 30 feet in height so that they would be prepared for a 250 year flood. Okay. So um, that was one of the big projects to happen. The last bridge to open to be dedicated was the North Star Bridge 1994. So this project spanned from at least the 1970s to 19, early 1990s. It's a major length of time for the project. When all is said and done, the concrete flood walls are over seven miles long. They are 33 feet tall. So our highest flood on record is 30 feet and we are prepared at 33 feet. Sure. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's it may be a, a separation from the river, but there's uh, a lot protecting us from future flooding. Right. Mankato's roots are firmly planted along the banks of the Minnesota River. After years of fighting the rising waters, the flood walls and levees were put in place. Some say there was a disconnect with the river after that, but now we're seeing a reconnection to the Minnesota River. Since then, Riverfront Park has opened, drawing thousands to the river each year. We're also seeing more development in the city center, offering river views to new tenants and residents and a trend of downtown development that will continue into the future. Thank you to those of you that shared your stories with us for this special broadcast, and a huge thank you to Jessica Potter and the Blue Earth County Historical Society and its volunteers for their help with this project. I'm Mitch Keegan. Thank you for watching Remembering the 1965 Flood.